So my name is Leos Nikuman. I'm the chair of the economics department. This is the best day of the department. Mm -hmm. We look forward to this day every year. It's, uh, the, it's called the Undergraduate uh, Events Day. And uh, it features the excellent work that our students are doing in all areas, uh, starting with this one, which is a debate. We have two great teams that are going to educate us. What's your, what's your topic again? <laughs> <laughs> Should the US eliminate pharmaceutical patents? Good. OK, so we'll hear the, the views from, from both teams. Then we'll have awards for um, various uh, areas of work and excellence. Then downstairs, uh, on the second floor, there is the Europe poster session. This is as uh, students have done research throughout the, the semester with the faculty members showcasing what they found. And uh, next door is the non-profit non community service project poster session. Uh, students who have worked with, with non-profit uh, agencies in the area, and they're going to tell you what they did uh, in, those, uh, in those places. Um, then we will have a cooperative enterprise program presentation at six, and the highlight is the senior barbecue, <laughs> which starts at six, I talked about the awards, I think. And then it starts at 4.30, but you have to do something before you can end. <laughs> <laughs> so you either have to be here in the debate, and go look at the poster sessions, and then you can earn your, your So I will now hand over to the moderator of the debate to introduce the, uh, the teams. I want to take a moment to thank our judges for taking the time to come, and we all rely on your support. These are long time supporters of the department. Thank you very much for coming. Well, my name is Harry Walsh. I'm a graduating senior of the economics department. I'm a governor of the undergraduate economics club, and I will be moderating this debate. Uh, if we'd like to just go around and counterclockwise, starting with the judges, uh, just introduce yourself briefly, and then maybe for the uh, debaters themselves, maybe your year and uh, your name and your year it might be good. So, Tom Peake. Hi, I'm Tom Peake, uh, class of 2013. I am a senior research analyst at the UMass Tonkin Institute, and I'm a city councilor in East Hampton, Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Bill Troy, class of sometime in the 70s. Um, <laughs> and I'm currently a senior lecturer at the University of New Hampshire. I'm Zach Beers, I'm class of 2015 in economics, and I'm the executive director of FENOM, the Public Higher Education Network in Massachusetts. I'm John Blum, a freshman. My name is Salvatore Viola, I'm also a freshman at the University of Massachusetts. Hello, my name is Bob Cole, and I'm a freshman. I'm Robert Fadash, I'm a freshman. My name is Mike Barbie, I'm a junior. Great. So now that we've introduced everyone, I'll just go over, first of all, the topic. Uh, should the US eliminate pharmaceutical patents? And we have our pro team, those in favor of uh, elimination, and then their opposition right here. Uh, the overall structure of the debate, we're going to have 30 minutes of opening arguments, so 15 minutes uh, for the pro team, then 15 minutes uh, just general detailed summary argument again in response for the other team. We'll then have a brief five minute break. Uh, everyone kind of collect their thoughts, and then we'll begin a time period of debate and rebuttal, which will be 16 minutes. So this will be basically alternating four minutes apiece twice. This will start with the, uh, the opposition right here, the anti, then go to the pro, anti, pro, four minutes each, where they'll be able to rebut and argue a little more rapidly. Uh, then we'll open up the floor to questions for 10 minutes, and so that should be maybe about time for three to four questions, depending on the length. So, so from uh, professors, alumni, and audience, we want to open it up to audience as well as we have in past years. Uh, and then 10 minutes of uh, closing arguments, which will be five minute pro and five minute anti incorporating rebuttals. Uh, for the benefit of the two teams, I'm going to be moderating by, I'll be giving you a visual two minutes with a peace sign here, visual one minute. Then I will say 30 seconds, and then I will call time. And when I call time, you don't need to cut yourself off mid-sentence, but just please finish up uh, very quickly, finish up that sentence or the, the most immediate thought. 
So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to the pro side. And once you guys are set up at the podium, I'll begin the time. Okay. government taking a central role to promote economic activity and innovation has existed throughout history of the history of capitalism. The creation of limited liability companies in the 18th and 19th centuries led to the concentration of enough capital to form the Great Steel Railroad and the chemical industries. Governments established tariffs and distributed subsidies to promote domestic industry. Without these government policies, it would be hard to argue that we would have seen such economic success in today's developed economic countries, especially the United States. Patents are one of the most interesting forms of government granted protection. In, 19, in 1790, then Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson oversaw the United States' first patent program. Then, for about $5, you could get a patent for up to 14 years. Today, a patent can cost upward of $1,000 and has a 20-year protection period. While protecting individual inventors from intellectual theft could su support innovation, when it comes to pharmaceutical patents, we clearly see government protection gone wrong. Patents allow companies to sell their drugs at incredible prices. A three-month treatment of Sovaldi, the hepatitis C drug, costs $84,000 in the United States. Meanwhile, in India, that same treatment costs only $200. If we equate this to a tariff, we are looking at a rate of over 40% thousand percent. The prices in those countries are more or less the result of intense negotiations between pharmaceutical companies and the national governments or through a system of price controls. Comparing the United States drug prices to the United Kingdom, while rheumatoid arthritis drug Humira costs $2,200 in the United States, the price in the UK is half that at $1,100. And while the antidepressant Cymbalta costs close to $200 in the United States, in the UK it only costs about 50 Patents allow pharmaceutical companies to conduct their research in secrecy. This allows them to leave out serious health risks associated with their products. An analysis of the inaccurate marketing of five different drugs which led to the death of tens of thousands of people found that the life value of the premature deaths is equivalent to the total cost of all pharmaceutical research during the period that these drugs were marketed. No wonder why prescription drugs are now the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Instead of accelerating innovation, patents can actually become a major impediment. During the Human Genome Project, a patenting of DNA sequences reduced further innovation by upwards of 30%. And in general, research and development also becomes more expensive due to the research materials themselves uh, being subject to patents. A particular concerning phenomenon among pharmaceutical companies is to engage in a process known as evergreening. This allows companies to prolong their monopolistic control of their products by making slight tweaks to the already existing medications and then patenting them as completely new and improved. Between 2005 and 2015, an incredible 78% of all drug patents approved by the FDA were these evergreen products. Even when a patent expires, there is no guarantee that the price of that formerly protected drug would decrease to the influx of generics. Companies with expiring patents can partake in pay for delay agreements with other companies planning to produce the generic version of the drug. Each year, these deals alone amount to $3.5 billion in higher drug costs. A pharmaceutical company can also produce authorized generics. After a patent expires, if the same company that produced the protected drug is the first to market a generic version of the drug, then it gets the sole right to market the drug for a six-month period, thus allowing them to capture the generic market. So not only can a manufacturer have monopolistic control over a drug while it is subject to a patent, but after that patent is expired as well. This completely contradicts the logic of having an expiration date on patents. To invite greater competition, which would in turn drive down prices. Thus, while patents alone incentivize pharmaceutical companies to partake in egregious behavior, the clandestine monopolistic nature of these firms that serves as a serious catalyst for the production of these exorbitantly priced mismarked medi medications. That's something both sides here can argue to. But do patents have an important role in determining the market prices for pharmaceuticals? Of course they do.
Pharma, the premier trade group of the pharmaceutical industry, boasts on their website that, quote, a fair, stable, and predictable patent system is the engine of the leading edge U.S. biopharmaceutical industry. They also describe patents as the lifeblood of the pharmaceutical industry. So the words engine and lifeblood involve some kind of source of progression and origin. What could that source be? Again, if we rely on pharma, they indicate that, quote, Patents ensure that the biopharmaceutical sector has the potential to recoup their significant R&D costs to fuel the next generation of scientific advancements, treatments, and cures. Thus, it is the cost of research and development that, according to the pharma industry themselves, motivates companies to acquire a patent, which in turn gives the company the sole price-making ability, regardless if they price out people who need these medications for their own survival. Last year, the health insurance giant Blue Cross and Blue Shield wanted to investigate why in recent years they have been paying so much more for prescription drugs. Now, they already don't want to pay for people's medical care, so obviously they would be very concerned if they had to shell out more money for their clients. Blue Cross and Blue Shield found that patented protected brand name drugs were responsible for the tremendous rise in prescription drug spending, increasing by 10% a year since 2010. While solely bringing the United States' regulation of drug prices in line with the rest of the world, such as allowing Medicare to negotiate with the pharmaceutical industry, can engender significant benefits, it does not go far enough to truly bring about a long-lasting transformative solution. We not only need to eliminate drug patents, but we also need to change how we do biomedical research and development. Here's what should be done. Instead of the government granting a protection that allows private pharmaceutical manufacturers to research their products with great liberty, the government should instead directly fund biomedical research. This can be done through the National Institutes of Health, which already spends $30 billion annually on research. Since the patent-protected private sector currently spends around $50 billion on biomedical R&D, tripling the NIH's budget would more than suit the nation's pharmaceutical research needs. Much of the research can be contracted out to private companies under several conditions. One, the research is publicly funded. Two, the companies are subject to direct governmental oversight. And three, everything produced from the research is in the public domain. If such a system were to be implemented, its savings would amount to over $300 billion a year, with possibly greater rates of innovation. Government programs such as Medicaid would see drug prices drop by 50%, and Medicare would see prices drop by 70%. This system ends the worst practices under the status quo. No longer will research be done in secrecy. No longer can companies manipulate their products to extend their patent protection, and no longer company, can companies justify charging the highest drug prices in the world. Uh, in our current economic system of like just basic capitalism, it's pretty much there's no real, or patents are what really determines why people choose to develop technologies. There's no, there's no motivator other than profit for most people to develop a new technology or develop any kind of drug. And this is usually okay um, if people choose to not develop a technology, there's usually no harm that comes of it. But in the healthcare industry, this is not really an option. Millions of people need life-saving drugs, and without these drugs being developed, 
and they could be developed, most people or many people will just die and there's no, there's no recourse for that action. Uh, but there's also no motivation for people to enter these industries if another company is just going to undercut them and produce the same product for much less cost. Um, without healthcare patents, most companies would either turn their resources, which are usually quite considerable because these, com these companies are huge and, and massive and have huge resources, uh, they would turn their resources to other kind of um, other products where, where these... Uh, other products that are don't serve society quite as well and would lead to most people, most all these patients who need these drugs uh, dying. And while this does drive the cost of, um, cost of these drugs up, a lot of this cost is covered by health insurance and also it's kind of these companies, it gives them the leeway to actually give, uh, sorry, uh, give away the drugs at lower cost to people who really need them when they don't have health insurance. And while it, this does um, create kind of a temporary monopoly for about 10 years, these companies really need a monopoly to survive because otherwise there's no way they can profit off of these drugs. And then there's no point in them creating any kind of health care or any kind of medicines that they need to do. Uh, yeah, it's also much better for these companies to develop these drugs sooner. So while patents are there for 10 years and they do hurt and create a monopoly for 10 years, there's really no, there's, these are necessary because otherwise these companies would not create these drugs at all and they would just constantly delay the manufacture of these kind of life-saving medicines, that, cancer drugs that people would not have otherwise. Thank you. Hello, I'll start and talk about clarifying what is a patent. So as this chart shows, um, the patent term lasts 20 years. The patents are run by the patent agency, not by the FDA. The patent is filed the second that the chemical process is constructed. That still has to go through tons of clinical development and clinical trials before approval by the FDA. Then there's this other thing called market exclusivity. Market exclusivity is ran by FDA. It's completely separate from patents. Patents do allow um, people to own their intellectual properties. Market exclusivity is allowed by the FDA to limit any competition within the field for that specific genome or that type of um, chemical process. So, even if they do have a patent extension, it usually does not last more than what the market exclusivity is. So that is what we need to look at. We need to look at market exclusivity, FDA, and federal regulations, not in the patents. So, as stated before, um, sorry, market exclusivity is only after the FDA has approved a drug for sale. Those are when these years of limited competition is allowed within the market. So the main one, and for the longest time period, is orphan drugs. Orphan drugs is a drug that is used for a disease that less than 200,000 people get affected with. But that's how the companies are able to use this and take advantage of it. So why would the companies want to do, want to create orphan drugs? So, if it has, this is an example using airline seating versus um, economy, business, and first class. To sell fewer of at higher class seats, you still gain a higher net revenue than if you did the same one or doing a more common drug. So there is more restrictions to an orphan drug just because it's limited in testing because of the limited amount of people you can trial. The cost of development are much higher, but there's also side effects or not really exactly side effects, but it can be used to cure other diseases as well. It not usually just work for the one specific drug. That's how they're able to sell it to multiple people. Martin Shrelly, one of the most hated men in America, currently in jail. As you heard, 
the drug Daraprim, Daraprim has skyrocketed in price. But that is not in the case of patents. That is in case by market exclusivity due to that being an orphan drug. Patents, actually one of the main component of the drug is actually not patented. So there could have been competition when it came to producing. But it is very cost, it's cost so much to actually start to go into the process of clinical trials to get it approved by the FDA. The FDA has one of the highest standards for generic drugs. Generic drugs must file biologically identical to the drug it's trying to copy from. Healthcare system. The healthcare system is one of the another key issues to why um, the cost of drugs are so high. As stated before, in different countries, the cost of a single pill would be much different than the cost of the United States. That is because the United States does not argue or negotiate with these uh, pharmaceutical companies to address how much it costs. Now, a, an organization like the Veterans Health Administration, the hospital, they actually do um, negotiate with the prescription drug companies and the pharmaceutical companies to lower their prices. But due to regulations and rules set in place, Medicare and Med uh, Medicaid cannot. So Medicaid and Medicare covers about 130 million people. The United States right now has about 325 million people. So majority, about 40% of people are covered by these two, and the government isn't even able to negotiate with the agencies. In Britain, as stated before, the British government is the only, uh, only body that purchases drugs from these pharmaceutical companies. That's why the prices are lower. They make, it makes, uh, they make it very clear. Either you buy it from, you buy it for, or you sell it to us for this price, or we don't buy it at all. So now, generic, uh, generic versus major pharmaceutical. You probably see this all the time. If you've ever been sick with the flu, you can probably get Dayquil and Nyquil, or you go to CVS and you get their brand, or Walmart's. To be sold as a generic brand, it must follow the exact same um, bioequivalent of what was approved by the FDA originally. And majority of the things when it comes to generic um, drugs is that they're usually produced by the same people that produced the name brand before. It is not as much of a substantial revenue increase as before, but now they still have a trickle effect from years on. Since they already have the footing and the placement and the infrastructure to continue. All businesses need profits to operate, whether it's Walmart, your local hardware store, or a pharmaceutical company. These patents are what allow the pharmaceutical companies to make a profit. Without the patents, they cannot sell their product for a profit, and the profits what allows them to pay their employee, employees and fund further research. My mother works for a small pharmaceutical company in Woburn, Mass, called PKC Pharmaceuticals. <coughs> Uh, PKC Pharmaceuticals has no more than 20 employees, and they wouldn't stand a chance against conglomerates like Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer without these patents. These patents give them the right to the research and the hard work that they do, that uh, a company like uh, Pfizer could easily undermine them, copy the product, and sell for less if there was no patents. Without patents, these small firms wouldn't stand a chance. Um, so our first rebuttal will be to address the whole patents do not allow for government to double check to see the safety and the regulations within 
the company and the testing that they're doing. Patents actually do that. Patents have to make sure that they maintain what are they filing, and the government keeps a record of everything they're using, all the components, all the materials, and the way it's done. If that isn't the case, then nothing would be patented. Following that, the FDA has a strict uh, regulatory inspection of all the steps and the process. If that was not the case, then the FDA would not approve the drug. There has been mis uh, mistakes during the past, but the main point is that the pens are the reason that the government is actually able to check, because without the pens, we would have no idea what people are doing and what steps or processes or who actually developed it first. Uh, for at least why these costs are so high, um, for in like a capitalist society, if we wanted to switch all the way to a socialist society, yes, we could have like these drugs being under government regulation and they could have be like strongly regulated. But I think if if you want these companies, their goal is to profit, and for that to happen, they have to set the prices. Otherwise, they will not manufacture the drugs, and then these drugs will not exist and that will be hugely detrimental to many patients across the country. Um, yeah. Um, lastly, just getting a partisan agreement on controlling uh, the government to control the drugs, that would be very tough. We see all the shutdowns, everything that happens now, trying to get the health care plan set up. Also, taxpayers would raise the money, raise money for taxpayers. They wouldn't be happy with that. Any sort of industry like Medicaid or Medicare that's run by the government usually is bogged down in tons of bureaucracy. It, do, they do, it doesn't run very well. It doesn't run very well, and these kind of uh, adding one more industry completely run by the government would cause just such a massive slowdown in development of new technologies. And the last point we'd like to address is that every country that was um, stated earlier and the prices of their pharmaceuticals do have patents, and most of the production is actually either in-house or traded among. So if we limit the amount of trade that could happen in the United States, that would cause a detrimental effect for all the residents and different types of patients who require the different drugs. That's why in 2015, Medicaid had the Generic Drug Act, which allowed um, Medicaid and Medicare to not limit the type of drugs to only be a certain brand, but also to allow generic drugs as well to try to reduce prices and also add the different type of competition. Thank you. Um. So firstly, the opposing team mentioned that research and development would not occur without high profits, but working solely for profits um, actually oh, does not increase or inspire innovation to create medicine that the public needs most, but companies are interested in which drugs will make the most profit and create pharmaceuticals that will be well marketed. This also means that their ideal market is the rich who can afford to buy their drugs. Their research is focused on curing lifestyle diseases experienced by the rich instead of curing diseases that overwhelmingly affect the poor. Um, marketability also has to do with um, OxyContin, which was a direct aim to increase profit per for Purdue Pharma, who um, created and marketed OxyContin purposely and purposely misled the public about the extremely addictive nature of the drug. Um, this caused to, this led to 14,800 overdose deaths in 2008 alone and is almost directly responsible for the heroin epidemic that exists today. So casualties like this happen when pharmaceutical companies are just in it to make a profit and not save human lives. Uh, yeah, a couple of things about, uh, I guess, the program that we uh, suggested. So one, there was a point brought up about raising taxes significantly, something like that. Um, the big thing with this program is that it would save $300 billion a year when we're asking to triple the NIH budget from about $30 billion to $90 billion. I mean, we're seeing an immense savings if we transition that. That's due to, you know, companies won't be allowed to, you know, mark up their drug prices to a tremendous amount um, because they justify it due to the patents, which is, I think, the core reason why we need to eliminate them. Um, another thing about, like, oh, it's just like companies, just a nice little negotiation between, you know, countries and these companies. You know, that's it. We just need to handle this market exclusivity thing, and it's cool. Um, but we also see indications of uh, countries 
not recognizing patents. Uh, we saw this in India recently a few years ago with the Lukumia drug. Uh, the company tried to throw an evergreen product. It was pretty much exactly the same. Indian government was like, well, we're not going to recognize this and we're going to produce our own generic, which was far cheaper, cheaper than the uh, evergreen product. So I just wanted to address those few remarks. And then, um, again, on patents uh, allowing uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies to profit so greatly off of their um, intellectual property, uh, we acknowledge that the, the costs of research and development are high. However, um, the pro they're making, pharmaceutical companies are making gross profits. Um, a study done by AARP found that five out of the six most profitable companies in America were pharmaceutical companies. So patents are the thing that are allowing companies, these pharmaceutical companies, to continue producing, um, producing and making such great profits when really they could produce for and make less profits. Thank you. Yeah. First, we'd like to address the whole um, Indian pan complication. The issue that we have with pans in India is that, yes, they did reject a certain claim. But if every country did that, then no country's intellectual poverty would be respected. No company would want to invest or trade outside of the borders because all they would do is just take their product and then do it themselves. That's not part of business. That's not trade. That's not trying to benefit. Yes, we can reject certain products. And yes, um, the polio vaccine, when it was first produced, was not patented. The creator actually made the quote. It says, can you patent the sun? No, you can't. But he had a motive to do it. He had the motive of saving millions of lives throughout time. He was known as one of the greatest medical breakthroughs in modern history. But that's a case one in few. What about people affected with a disease that only affects 20,000 people, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000? What about those people? Every year, again, more and more, the AIDS epidemic, the heroin, uh, heroin epidemic, the whole AIDS, um, cancer, much research comes through this ability to profit to invest back into it. Um, for the companies that just want to profit will ignore uh, dangers with drugs like Oxycontin. Uh, that is true, but that has a lot more to do with government regulation and, and has little to do with actual patents because the patent itself will, will not like cause companies to ignore, um, will not cause them to ignore the side effects. The, the fact that they have no oversight or regulation is a problem, but that does have little to do with the actual patents and them getting any profit profitability out of that drug. Um, lastly, with the evergreening, I would that is a that's a problem with the way patents are set up, not patents themselves. People have a right to their discoveries, their research, what they make. So maybe just reform the patent laws instead of being so lenient with them. One last thing is that the majority of revenue that comes back into the pharmaceutical industries does not come from the period of the patent. Majority of the period of the patent is lost through the clinical process and clinical research. Market exclusivity after approved by the FDA, which allows sales, is what gives much of the revenue, which is run by the FDA, a completely separate entity than the patent office itself. Patents were used throughout history when even the car industry, the airplane industry, and everything. There was still competition that came afterwards. But there was not this market exclusivity that lasted longer than the date of production and sale that has the, real, the big impact that we see today. And most of the impact and the high prices is because of something completely separate from patents. It's market exclusivity and the FDA. So in your rebuttal just then, you made a point or a hypothetical 
argument about a disease or some illness that affects a small part of the population. So 20,000, 30,000, however uh, many you said. But that was a point that we made in our introduction that when there are these diseases that only affect a smaller portion of the population, there's even less incentive for pharmaceutical companies to produce drugs for them because there aren't enough consumers in the market. So if they produce a drug where only 20,000, 10,000, 30,000 people will buy it, they won't be able to profit off, it, off of it unless they sell it for a ridiculously high price. Um, I would also like to address the Oxycontin argument that was made before. Um, you mentioned that they're not ignoring the side effects to make a profit, but I feel like that's exactly why they're doing it. Um, patents allow them to make these outrageous profits, and then they market it to people as if there are no side effects, and that's how people die. And they're not the only um, pharmaceutical that's ever done this. There's a few drugs, um, Vioxx, Avandia, Bextra, and Zyprexa, which have all, all like are the top five um, drugs that have caused deaths because of profits and misleading side effects. Yeah, so I have uh, two key points. Um, so one about that if patents are gone, then like it would be a disaster because now other countries that we trade in can't get those, uh, those pharmaceuticals. Um, we saw this debate recently with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Uh, so we had companies that tried to enforce stronger patent protection within those agreements. What we saw in reaction to that was actually in other countries, public health advocates as well as the World Health Organization actually came, ag came against those stronger patent protections and argue that those actually be detrimental to the public health of countries around the world. Uh, another thing, we talked about the uh, creation of the polio vaccine. Um, it's actually interesting, we look at how that was created. So it was created by March for Dimes, which is an initiative by federal, by uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And how that was funded was actually through, yes, we're like, hey, everyone got loose change, uh, bring in donations and we'll together fund this uh, great cure. Um, and I would say they were successful at that. Uh, so that was, I think, a completely different model than, uh, say, some big uh, firm trying to, like, okay, guys, we got to, like, you know, create this product. We have to do this in sort of, like, a secret way because we don't want all this getting out because we could always, you know, put sugar in it and claim it does this when maybe it does this. We're not going to tell them about maybe this heart effect that it might have and, oh, well, if it gets to the market. Um, looking at you, Viox. Um, so, yeah, so I think really looking at, like, the core R&D component of that and really switching that to a more public model, a more transparent model, and while it can be quite effective at bringing drugs to the market that are affordable um, and that to benefit uh, the American population. Thank you. I guess generally, if there's anyone who has a question I want to ask generally or specifically to any of the debaters, sure, we'll start with you. Um, I have a question for uh, the guests. Uh, in their opening argument, the pro side, in addition to sort of criticizing the current patent system, suggested an alternative approach where instead of research being done, uh, in order to, to make a profit off the sales of drugs. That's a company. Uh, that research would be done as a publicly funded process, and, and then the, the results of that research would then become, if I uh, understand this correctly, uh, part of the public domain. Uh, I, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that idea and, and, and why you think that would or wouldn't Well, most of that comes in from research. Most of the research actually is done by government or universities or other side firms, which is then given to the company or works with them. Um, with the whole idea of public domain in the research is that, yes, it could be done, but it's not specialized for that one uh, like incident. To enforce the infrastructure in the United States to make research be its prime part of researching the pharmaceuticals for all these different variations of the different diseases would be a great expenditure at first and even later on 
and during the whole process, these companies are specialized to do drug research over long periods of time. They have the setup, the infrastructure, and they might have it dispersed throughout different parts. And by working with different universities and the government, how they get these results. But PADs are not responsible for the safety of a drug. The FDA is there as a governmental agency to inspect and review all the clinical trials. PADs are there just to confirm, to keep the idea that if a company spends millions or billions of dollars to research into a single type of drug, then they deserve to have the credit afterwards to be able to sell it, if it is approved by the FDA. PANS do not give a straight shot to be approved. That is the FDA's falter and lack of responsibility. <coughs> the PAN office itself is only just to keep the domain of the idea that they came up with and the product that they have in their hands. Um, yeah, on the proposing change, the model you are selecting reminds me of the model of how we do defense spending. That there's a handful of players who are making all the choices. And I don't think the history of defense spending is something that necessarily is economically efficient, it has led to a lot of waste. And particularly in terms of disease, uh, I, I, the second point, I'd like you to address the fact of how do you make decisions on which diseases you're going to tackle and which aren't you going to tackle. Because in a political system, it just becomes a matter of lobbying, doesn't it? It's not scientific analysis. So those, I'll have those two questions and observations. So for the first point, I would say comparing it to contract part of defense. Um, so the reason why we see a lot of, I would say, a lot of like, mismanagement and overspending for defense is because because it is for defense, it has to be kept in secret. The public can't really know what exactly the research and what's going on. Right? You can't put a nuclear weapon in the public domain. So um, so I think there's just things that are just very different from what you would spend and invest in what we like the public to know when it comes to government defense products versus say work that will be done for public health reasons. Maybe it's a question. Okay, so for the uh, second question, um, I can't really say what we should prioritize what we shouldn't. Um, I think that's just best to the actual uh, public health experts that were within the NHS. The NHS, so um, the NIH, sorry. Uh, so it's from 2010 to from 2016, the, the NIH was involved with 97% of the FDA approvals for drugs. They had some sort of contribution to it. Um, so they're well aware, of course, what the priorities of this country is for producing medications. I would say so. Um, so I think it's really up to the experts and them to decide what is should be the country's priority going forward. So there's no market in your, there's no real market. There's lobbying and there's experts. But there's no there's no view of um, a, a market or profit based approach. So when it comes to the research and development, pretty much it's pretty much come in, do work. I mean the government will give you a grant, give you an award. So we you know based on that sort of system, mm -hmm. you'll be rewarded for you know, your contribution, whatever it is. And then that public domain, so it's like, oh, wow, that was a cool innovation. I'm going to take it. I'm going to expand upon that. Now look what I created here. Uh, when it comes to like the actual end of the word production of medication itself, we don't address that because we think really the core thing when it comes to patents is that research and development phase, which is really that justification for why they have patents and thus why you see these incredible drug prices. I think it's really addressing that first phase uh, is essential for our so I have a question for each. Um, one, I just wanted to go, I'll go with your side first. Um, you know, clearly we have kind of a mixed system here. It's not completely capitalist. It's not completely government run. Um, government's doing some research, companies are doing other parts of research. And also, just to clarify, Medicare actually has lower administrative costs than most private insurance. Um, so my question for you guys is, you know, you said you need a profit to, to, to operate. 
you need in, 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 your chart said this, you need an income to operate, you, know, you need money to pay people, and, and you don't necessarily need to make money on top of that. So have you done any research into um, how much of the profits from these companies are actually being reinvested in research versus how much um, is going to shareholders and executives? No, we didn't, but in some companies' cases it would be public and other companies would not. A uh, majority of companies that are pharmaceutical companies are actually public, so you can't actually invest in their stocks. Uh -huh. So if the company's doing well, you could be doing well as well. Uh -huh. um, 401k, for example, if you want to invest into the companies that are being profitable, you yourself, you yourself will get profit back. I think they're also not necessarily obliged to put that money back into research and development. They are allowed to make profit if they choose to do so. Uh, if, if they want to invest in another drug, that is the prerogative, but they are not necessarily obliged to. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then for, for your side, um, I think this team made a really good point that patents and the FDA process are separate processes. Um, so I'm just wondering, I think by creating a whole new system, you're kind of, you might have answered this already, but answered my question already, but just to clarify, um, would eliminating patents for pharmaceuticals also uh, address the market exclusivity um, time period, or would that be eliminated as well? Or, you know, the FDA, even, if you, even if they didn't have a patent, would the FDA be able to come and say, you could still, you're still the only one to sell it? rebuttals to the, the arguments that you made. So obviously one of the 
largest arguments here about whether or not we should eliminate patents is the, the prices that are uh, like associated with companies having uh, such protection over their intellectual property. And so we gave like examples over um, certain drugs having these price discrepancies between um, different countries and even within the United States, uh, drugs that have gone up in prices, uh, price arbitrarily just because of new ownership. Um, but I guess the bottom line with that is like showing these uh, price hikes or the discrepancies between countries is that the fact of the matter is these drugs can be produced and sold for less than they are being sold for. And so uh, that's to our first point. Um, second point that uh, the um, side again, uh, for patents, for keeping patents made was that they are the sole or one of the main incentive for companies to continue producing or inventing and developing these, these drugs. And I feel that that's not the sole in incentive. I mean, with, without the, like, the, like such access to high profits, there's still some demand for these products because they are, in many cases, life-saving or necessary for many people to live. Um, and in addition to these uh, patents existing to incentivize um, research and allow uh, exclusive rights to a single company, this in turn limits the collaboration that could potentially happen between multiple firms which would then um, uh, advance uh, research and development. So in conclusion, because of like these outrageous, outrageous prices and like a skewed focus on some of the drugs that are chosen to be produced, there's, this is just patents create sort of an unacceptable problem in the prices of these drugs when they hit the market. Um, and it's true that these, these drugs do take tens of years to develop and research and make it to the market and that it can cost millions or billions of dollars, but when it comes down to it, these drugs are there to improve people's lives and, and of, oftentimes even save them too. So eliminating patents would lower prices and make these drugs more affordable to the people who really need them. Thank you. We want to talk about safety of the people. One of the biggest things is if we do make certain things public domain, like as stated, we have the fear of the defense budget or defense innovation. What about anthrax? What about other biological experiments or research done? There, every year bacteria become stronger and stronger and we have to build, uh, create medicines that are able to keep up with their um, evolution and their adaptation to our bacterial. What if people use that for other negative reasons? Anthrax was a common bacteria that was used and made into a chemical wep a bacterial weapon later on. What would happen if that was going to happen now? If all of our biological or pharmaceutical understanding of um, antibiotics or anything like that, or spe specialty diseases or specialty uh, vaccines were used against us? Safety is our biggest priority. Argument of price of drugs. As stated before, other countries do have it cheaper. Other countries also have patents as well. What are they doing differently? As we stated before, their FDA or their Bureau for Investigating D Drugs are not looking into adding these mar uh, market exclusiv exclusivities, which are not patents. Patents are already mostly expired by the time that it's produced or actually being sold. It's the countries and the government. The government is what we have to in, uh, reform, not the patents. We have to reform the FDA, higher inspections. Yes, it makes it hard, but patents allow small businesses and workers to work around it. And the orphan drugs is the main reason that these small diseases with only having 20, 30, 100,000, because they have incentive from the FDA. The seven years of market exclusivity gives them enough time to sell the drug in such a long time at such a high price that they do make money back and able to invest into other drugs. 
because they don't have just one drug going at a time. They'll have multiple. Because maybe one will be the golden pill, many will be a bust. That's why the amount of money that we do gain during these studies and during the research and during the profits do actually go back to research. For every one pill, the million dollar pill that actually is produced, there are many failures that have to be reinvented and take years of study, research, and creation. We would like to say that yes, pens is a clinical or was a you know, basic part of the United States throughout all of its history and it should still remain. I feel like we should reform different things. We should have the government interact and negotiate better with the pharmaceutical companies. We should look at the FDA inspecting the drugs more closely and also talking about the market exclusivity and also safety. We should make sure that the people are safe. Not only when it comes to what other people can do with these drugs, but also can we give it to our people? And we've so far been doing a great job with that. Yes, we can always get better, and that's what we want to work on. But patents should remain. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank both sides. Uh, this has been a really interesting debate. Uh, I've been to a bunch of these. I participated in one of them and lost badly. But uh, <laughs> I think that uh, this was probably the closest debate that I've ever personally observed here uh, at the uh, economics department. Um, we believe that the pro side led out with a really strong argument of not just saying what's wrong with the system, but suggesting an alternative on how many of those problems can be addressed. Um, the against side uh, and countered with, with a lot of really great research into how the system actually works. Uh, and I think that uh, they should probably be commended for having, in many ways, the better researched argument in terms of how patents work and what exact uh, issues here are the result of patents versus the FDA versus the market structure. Um, that was a really, really strong argument that, that was very persuasive to us. Um, but at the end of the day, we felt that the against side never uh, adequately rebutted the initial argument of the pro side that um, they could, that an alternative system could potentially yield better outcomes. And so we want to give a very, very close win uh, to the pro side.
Hey, that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's every year, not to cr criticize past debaters, present company included, who did a wonderful job, uh, but it just does seem to me every year these debates get better and better. You know, um, I don't know, are you guys learning from the past or is this just the world is getting better all the time? And if you look at the undergraduates in this department, yeah, it gives you some reason for hope. You know, I, some of you may have remember my late dog, Beowulf. He died a couple days after the presidential election 2016. He rolled over and he looked at me and he said, no, I, I can't go on. He obviously was not paying attention to our undergraduates. You know, and this crop of undergraduates is particularly impressive. I'm really looking forward to working with you guys over the next bunch of years. Uh, some of you may not recognize me um, because I'm here without my dog. Um, I was our new dog, Corduroy. My wife stole him um, just as I was coming back from, I was in a debate this morning at Western New England. As I was coming back, she was pulling down the driveway and I got out of the car that somebody was driving me, got out of the car and waved. And, you know, and she just waved. And I said, what about Corduroy? And she said, I'm taking him with me. And she drove off, so I'm alone. But I'm with friends, so thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, as Leon said, this is the best day of the year at UMass Amherst Economics Department um, because this is the day when we get to not only celebrate all the great undergraduates, but hear the next crop of great undergraduates. Um, so thank you all. And we get to meet some parents and some of the old friends. Thank you for coming back, and thank you for visiting us you know, for the first time, or at least first time that I've seen you, or the first time in the last week, whatever. OK, we have a bunch of awards. Um, and we're going to start with the economic, as is keep in keeping with the presence of the alums. We're going to start with the Economics Alumni Award for Distinguished Service. Um, this is granted by the Economics Alumni Advisory Board to students who have contributed to UMass Amherst community, particularly to the Department of Economics. Now that John Hurd left, we can say we don't care about the rest of UMass Amherst community. All we care about is the Economics Department, so, you know, so I could almost strike some of the rest, but still. Um, this is a real pleasure because I've known the two winners for oh, a few years, uh, past debaters, uh, leaders of the Economics Club, and they are very well deserving. And they're also moving on to do great things in the future. Uh, the first one is Matthew Harmon, if he would. Uh, um, well. Well, he's not here. I don't see him. Do you see him? Is he, no, he's not here. OK, well, Matthew Harmon is a third-term governor of the Undergraduate Economics Club, and he's going off to the Center for Economics and Policy Research in Washington this summer. OK, that's pretty cool. Um, next comes Harry Walsh, who you all know because he moderated the debate. <laughs> Harry is from Attleboro, Mass, and at UMass, he is the governor of the Undergraduate Economics Club, coordinating the next edition of MOOJ, the Massachusetts Undergraduate Journal of Economics, and he will be starting full-time at REMI, the Regional Economic Modeling, uh, which was founded by one of our colleagues in the past, um, where he will continue to develop skills with economic statistical modeling. And he moderated the debate very well. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> Next, we have the Economics Alumni Award for Outstanding Achievement, which is granted by the Economics Alumni Advisory Board to a student who has demonstrated outstanding achievement, either academically or within service to the university or community. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap in these categories. Um, and this goes to Mark Ambrose. Mark is a graduating senior studying economics and political science. He served on the Undergraduates Economics Board of Governors and is part of the Alpha Chi Rho fraternity. And he brought his parents, so welcome to you. Thank you for coming. Uh, the Economics Writing Award is presented to the student with the best paper in economics. 
um, there's overlap between this and another um, uh, paper award. And this goes to Jacob Edel, who is here with his parents. And Jacob has been involved with the UMass Theater Guild since his first semester. Way to go, Jacob. Hey. I like yes, yes, so stick around. He's been the treasurer, being an economics major. He has, of course, made the treasurer um, uh, for a year and a half. And he's worked as a research assistant in political science for the last two semesters. We'll forgive him that <laughs> because he's bringing skills from there to us. So Thank it's you. important. Thank you, Jacob. And welcome to parents. Uh, next, out of order, uh, E.W. Eldridge Jr. Memorial Scholarship. Um, this is given, established in 1966. Wow. For the purpose of the awarding scholarships to worthy and exceptional economic students. And I can tell you this year's winner is exceptional. Um, Anya Conte uh, is Conte is graduating with a dual degree in economics and mathematics, currently finishing work on a thesis to analyze sustainable development projects, and next year she will be pursuing a master's in statistics at the London School of Economics, after which she hopes to work in the fields of climate change, migration, and sustainable development, and no doubt will save the world. Um, she obviously is too busy to make it today, so sorry, Anya. Um, next we have, but she should get a round of applause. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Next, we get the Highest Academic Achievement Award. This is presented to a junior or senior with a top GPA within the major. And this one, it goes to Connor Bond, who, well, okay, Connor's not here either. Um, but he has a good line here. He's a junior economics major with a minor in political science, and if he could meet on any economist for coffee, it would be John Maynard Keynes. So obviously he got a good education at UMass. <laughs> okay, next we have the Finnegan Family Scholarship, set up for economics majors in good academic standing, made possible by generous donation of Deborah Finnegan, a parent of economics department majors. This goes to Cooper Heilman, who is notable because he has a really good reason for not being here. He's in Copenhagen doing his junior year abroad. So you can give him applause anyway, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Next, we have the Jacqueline Dorfman Scholarship for Women, set up for women studying economics in good academic standing and made possible by the generous donation of Jacqueline Dorfman, class of 1982. And this goes to Jeanne Celestin, who's here <laughs> with, I think, her mother. Yes, yes. Jeanette is going off to the American Economics Association summer program after graduation and hopes to study, get a PhD in economics. Maybe here. <laughs> and thank you to mom. <laughs> and now, the James Kindle Award awarded to an economic student with a commitment to social issues of public policy concerns, strong writing skills, and a record of excellence in economic history. All things important to Professor James Kindle. And my colleague, Carol Heim, will proceed from here. Thanks. So first of all, I'm just going to show you Professor Kindle, who is a very wonderful person. I'm going to leave this up here for anyone who wants to have a look at him. As Professor Friedman said, the Kindle Prize is awarded to a student who has a commitment to social issues or public policy concerns, strong writing skills, and or a record of excellence in economic history. Professor Kindle taught in the economics department from 1967 until 1998 when he retired. He also served as department chair for three years and was the undergraduate program director for many years. He passed away in 2003. Professor Kindle was an extraordinary person who was appreciated tremendously by his students and colleagues. It was actually one of his former students, Tammy Murphy, who put a lot of energy into helping getting the prize, to get the prize set up in 2004. Professor Kindle spent countless hours teaching and advising students. 
Students and colleagues knew that they could always count on his wisdom, his calm good humor, his sense of balance and perspective, and his combination of unshakable principles and genuine open-mindedness. He treated everyone with the utmost respect, fairness, and decency. I know that many, many students benefited greatly from his teaching and advising and from his commitment to our undergraduate program. He also shared his ideas about teaching with his colleagues, including me, and those ideas were always valuable. Remembering how he lived his life continues to be an inspiration to all of us in the economics department who were fortunate enough to know him and those who weren't. So I'm very pleased um, to announce that the recipient of this year's Kindle Prize is Megan Dunn. Megan's one of my students this semester, so I'm especially happy for her, and I know she's well deserving of it. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Carol. Uh, if I may add just one point about Megan, she's a senior finance and economics dual degree with a minor in Spanish. Um, and she's receiving the Eisenberg Citizens First Certificate, which emphasizes the importance of community service and giving back. So thank you very much, Megan. So the John Hubby Scholarship, uh, set up for economics majors in good academic standing and made possible by generous donation of John Hubby, class of 84, currently a partner at KPMG, um, which means that he came here when I left. I hope there was nothing personal involved in that. You know. um, and this goes to Robert Heck, who is not here. Um, on top of being a, oh, right, right, yeah, he's not here for good reason, let me tell you. On top of being a student at UMass, Robert Heck is the owner of Bob Heck Entertainment, DJ Lighting Photo Booth in Pittsfield, Mass. Um, he intends to get his master's in public policy, hopes to work in economic development to help revitalize depressed areas in western Massachusetts. He currently lives in Pittsfield with his wife Jennifer and his two daughters Kendall and Ashley, and he had to drive them to dance today. <laughs> so, you know, and he was also doing a radio show, but, uh, you know, in between, driving them, doing the radio show, and then driving back and picking them up again. I think our undergraduate, chief undergraduate advisor, um, Val Voorhees, who is a great person to have around, um, she's wonderful. She should stand up, get applause. Yeah, come on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Val can appreciate being the mom taxi. Um, okay, uh, next we have the Ward McCarthy Scholarship for Interns. Um, and this is a, made possible by the generosity. We have one winner of this so far and one not yet available, so we're going to hold off on this one. And then we're up to the Werritt Scholarship. This scholarship was made possible by the generous donation of Rose, what? Oh, okay. So we have, um, for the Ward McCarthy, present two students, and we've got only one so far chosen, completing an internship during the 2018 calendar year, and this goes to Antonio Morini, um, who is right here. <laughs> what are you doing, your um, internship? Oh, Ah, okay. Antonia is going to be w working this summer at the Dorchester Food Co-op, where she will be helping to feed the working class and others it's in Massachusetts. Eventually. Mm -hmm. It will eventually be feeding. So she will be helping to feed them. Yes, thank you. Are you taking her course? Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, and then we have two Werritt scholarships. Uh, this scholarship was made possible by the generous donation of Rosemary Werrett, class of 62. Uh, Ms. Werrett once came, last year at some point she came visiting, and I got to spend an absolutely delightful half hour chatting with her in my office. Um, she travels the world and knows all this really interesting stuff about finance and economic development in different countries. She's worked as a journalist and now she's an economic analyst, um, has her own company, and um, this scholarship was set up for economics majors and good academic standards uh, with a preference given to females, to women studying international economics. Um, and we have two winners of this. The first one is 
Jin Tong Zheng, uh, who's coming up. <laughs> and, and Jin, whose parents are too far away to come to this, um, uh, certainly on short notice, and they have to work, is a senior at UMass and will be graduating in 15 days. In, in the future, she would like to work as an economic consultant for an international company. That way she could work on what she's passionate about and have opportunities to travel, which would fit perfectly with what Rosemary Werrett does. Her parents live far from Amherst. They have to work, so she should not be able to come to the ceremony. But please tell them we miss them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and finally, we have Vict uh, Victoria Abram, Abram Chuck. Abram Chuck? Abram Chuck. Abram Chuck, okay. Yes. <laughs> Whose father is here? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. In the fall of 2018, Victoria will be starting her junior year here, so we've got one more year of you. Yeah. Um, as an economics, legal studies, and Spanish triple major. Oh my God, I feel so inadequate compared to our undergraduates. <laughs> Her passion lies not only in her, you said not in your, but I'm going to say not only not in only. your, in your academic coursework, but in people with a penchant for public policy. She plans to use what she learns to uh, foster real social change. Currently, she's interested in a variety of policy areas, including, but not limited to, education, labor, finance, and markets. So, you know, another world changer. And thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for visiting. Okay, up we have an arrival. <laughs> Matthew Harmon, yes, there you are, man. Hey, good to see you. you. Yeah. Off, he's off to Sepra to change the world and make it a lot better. Good for you. Right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, one more point to mention, Harry Walsh. We'll be doing the senior speak, senior talk. Or does that Matthew? Who's doing the senior talk? <laughs> you are, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Matthew is also going to do the senior talk at graduation. Thank you, I knew it was one of the two of you. Okay, could we have one final big round of applause for these great students and all the work they do? Thank you so much. <laughs>